today. And uh, as uh, we've had in the past, uh, we've had people from all walks of life join us on this series uh, to talk about uh, their experience uh, during this uh, pandemic with the coronavirus. And we've had um, law enforcement uh, join us where they in fact just went around their community, some Arvada policemen to serenade to some shut-ins who had not been able to leave their homes because of uh, potential transmission and, and uh, picking up the infection uh, from the virus. We've had uh, a big bike manufacturer in the Golden area uh, that has been making shields, turned their assembly line of bikes into uh, making shields for uh, healthcare workers. Uh, we've had um, glove manufacturers and liquor store owners and teachers. And today uh, we are very fortunate to have a couple uh, from the farming uh, community and uh, sugar beet growing community uh, join us to talk about uh, their experiences both uh, in the in the agriculture industry generally uh, but also how the uh, pandemic how the COVID-19 virus has affected uh, their businesses uh, their operations and uh, what they've been doing about it so first I want to turn to a friend of mine uh, Paul Schlegel, who has uh, uh, visited with me over the course of the last 10, 15 years about all issues uh, per pertaining to the agriculture industry, but particularly to the sugar beet industry. And I want to welcome him to our Local Heroes uh, series. And uh, Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit about your operations uh, up in Boulder and, and Longmont, uh, or up in Boulder and Weld County? and uh, what you're doing and uh, how that is going. So tell us a little bit about your uh, farming business. Okay, thank, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to do this. Uh, I hope it, it turns out very well. Uh, interesting, it's good to see you again, even though it's not in person, but uh, I, I am actually a fourth generation farmer in my family. My son, Scott, is now with the, with the farm and, and he will be the fifth. Uh, our family's been growing sugar beets for over a hundred years. We did a little presentation a few years ago, and my mom actually has kept track of everything that the family does back through the history as long as we've been in the States. But sugar beets has always been an integral part of our farms, you know, from, from the very beginning since the uh, Great Western Sugar Company came into existence in the early 1900s. Uh, we probably, we farm about 250 acres of sugar beets in northern Colorado, and we, we are along the front range. We are kind of limited in, in our operation because of the expansion of the homes in and around Longmont, Boulder, and Weld County. So we're a little bit landlocked. We have to be innovative in, in what we do to, to stay in business. Uh, technology has been very important in the in the recent years and w along with that technology is rather expensive to 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 obtain to put on in practice and being limited what we our resources are in acres we have to be pretty resourceful in what we do but uh i think technology has made us very efficient in what we do uh we're growing sugar beets more sugar beets on one acre I mean, probably twice as many beets on one acre as we did when we first, and when I first started. So that's pretty impressive, pretty impressive numbers, and that that translates into the whole company. Talked a little bit about the coronavirus and how it's affected us. Uh, fortunately, I mean, we're 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 small. We have uh, a four-person crew. Uh, so far, nobody has has been ill. We we started out very vigilant. Uh, trying to make sure we kept our, our distances, which was very difficult. We did a lot of sanitizing, cleaning, make sure that everybody was as safe as possible. The difficult part was that we work in close contact. I mean, we're very, you know, you're, you're meeting each other day, throughout the day, uh, and we share equipment, so we try to make sure everything was cleaned and, and sanitized before 
the next person used it. Uh, I think harvest time is probably the most difficult and the most stressful and, and, and being concerned about the virus because then again, you're, you're touching a lot more lives. People are getting together. You're, you're using one scale house. Everybody's, you know, touching the same thing. So again, one person that could spread very quickly. There's no, there's no way to put off till tomorrow what we need to do today when it comes to harvesting. Uh, we got through all of our small grain harvest un, unscathed, so we feel very, very comfortable where we're at right now. Uh, sugar beet harvest starts a week from tomorrow. Uh, hopefully we're ready to go. And again, we're, we're concerned about how the virus will affect that harvest. One thing we do, and I said we got to be creative, uh, being we're kind of limited in our acreage, uh, we've been doing some small grain to distilleries uh, in the last five years, and we have donated grain to three different distilleries that, that turned their operations into making hand sanitizer uh, in the last couple of months, which is kind of it's satisfying to be able to do that. They done very well. They they put out a lot of hand sanitizer. Hopefully, it went to the right people. So it's been a very very interesting 2020, as it's probably been with with everyone else. So well, I'm not I, Rebecca. I want to come back and uh, talk to you about the hand sanitizer, but first I want to turn uh, to Dr. Rebecca Larson, who um, is a scientist. Uh, in the in the field of uh, plant science, and I know that you two work together on a variety of things. And uh, I just like her to introduce herself. I, you know, it's very uh, uh, impressive for us to have a uh, a scientist uh, join us on uh, on our local heroes uh, program. But uh, Rebecca, would you please tell us a little bit uh, about yourself? And uh, send, uh, there you go. There you go. Sure, so my name is Rebecca Larson and I hold a PhD in plant science with an emphasis in plant pathology. So my specialty is plant diseases, not human diseases, but there's actually quite a bit in common. Uh, this is actually, I'm in the middle of Wyoming on my way up to harvest some beet plots in uh, Lovell this afternoon. But this is my 21st campaign working with sugar beets. That's been my main focus this entire time. My last five and a half years have been with Western Sugar Cooperative serving as their chief scientist and VP of governmental affairs. Nice, so um, where did you go to school? Why don't you give us a little background uh, in terms of uh, where you went to college, where you got your PhD? Sure, so I got my bachelor's degree from St. Cloud State University. It's located in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Actually, both my grandparents were professors there at one point in time. So it was a given that that's where I was gonna go to college for at least something. And then from there, I went to Montana State University in Bozeman, and that's where I received my PhD. And I've been in Colorado after, uh, since 2004, after a brief stint in Fargo, North Dakota, doing a postdoc with the USDA. So tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, the pandemic has affected uh, the sugar beet industry and farming generally from your perspective, kind of as a scientist who's, you know, trying to improve uh, production, improve the quality, improve uh, the success of these farms. Uh, how has the pandemic uh, affected these things from your point of view? And then what are some of the things you're doing as a scientist uh, that may be related to this pandemic to try to minimize it uh, either for the people around you or just generally? So I think the biggest thing that's hit us as a beet sugar cooperative is the demand. So at first there was this huge increase in demand. I'm sure you saw that too, going to the grocery store, shelves were cleaned out. And I think partially that's sh sugar is a comforting food. So when you're home with your family and you're spending time together, baking can bring some sense of normalcy and some sense of comfort to the family. So the sugar was cleared off the shelves darn quickly. So for us, it was about making sure that we could keep that continual supply going. So as Paul mentioned, there's not a lot of wiggle room for delaying when it's in farming. You're at the will of mother nature. So all this kicked off right as we were getting ready to plant a new crop. So it had to be business as usual, but you know, Paul mentioned the, the sensitivities of trying to keep his team safe. I think something that a lot of people don't think about from an agricultural perspective is 
the mean age of farmers in the United States is in that key sensitivity range of 65 plus. So I think about that a lot. I, I travel across all four states in which we operate, even though I'm based in Colorado. So as I was heading out to plant in April, right at the peak of this, when there was so much uncertainty, it was about how do I make sure that I'm minimizing interactions with our growers and making sure that I don't get anybody sick since this is such a, a, a different type of disease where you can be a carrier and not even know it. So just having those extra precautions and even people on my own little team of three being more sensitive. I have an employee that has a, a son that's under a year old. I have another employee that's uh, over 65. So just being cognizant of those sorts of things. Um, from my perspective with the pandemic, I don't focus so much on human disease, but I do focus a lot on plant disease. And I think we're gonna see more of these sorts of things in the future as the global population grows. The global population interacts a lot more and we're gonna have to find ways of using technology to make sure that we can keep people safe, but also keep people fed. So from a plant science perspective, we've really focused a lot on uh, sustainable intensification, so making sure we can produce more with less to keep everybody healthy, happy, and fed. So I, uh, I got a chance to tour uh, Colorado Department of Health uh, laboratory uh, a few weeks ago where uh, much of the attention is focused on COVID, but it spans much more to listeria and salmonella and bubonic plague and you name it. Uh, Zika and West yeah. Nile. So uh, I think you're right. Um, really, as the globe is uh, more and more integrated and we have a smaller world, I mean, we're going to see pretty exotic things coming from all over the place and a lot of it having to do with uh, plant science. So is, you know, as you're, as a scientist, um, what kinds of things are you looking for with the beets or with, um, you know, products generally to kind of, you know, keep an eye on new kind of crazy toxic strains of things. I don't know how to describe it, but I assume that's one of the things you've got to do as a plant scientist, keep an out, a lookout for that stuff. Yeah, and we're very lucky. Western Sugar and all the beet sugar producers in the United States are a closed market. So a seed company can't come to our farmers and say, hey, I have this hot new hybrid that you should try, plant it on your farm. It's my job and my team's job to test those hybrids for several years to make sure that the yield is going to be adequate, the sugar content's adequate, but more importantly, that those plants contain tolerance to the seven norms, and that's what helps minimize friction with climate change in particular, one of the things that we're looking for is managing newly emerging pests and diseases as the climate changes. We're going to see new pests and diseases coming onto the farm. How do we identify tolerance for those things? But then also a lot of the pest and disease tolerance that we have is incomplete and not very durable. So working with agencies like the USDA Agricultural Research Service to make sure that they can improve their breeding tools to make those disease tolerances more complete and more robust to minimize that long-term risk on the farm. Great. Where are you in Wyoming right now? Uh, I am in between Casper and Shoshone. Can you tell by my reception? <laughs> <laughs> a little, a little bit. Actually, it's pretty good for being all, you know, way up there. But no, yeah, so, <laughs> no, thank you. So, well, I'm going to switch back to Paul for just a second. And, you know, I, uh, you're a farmer, but I think you're really an engineer at heart because of some of the things you've done to, you know, using the, the science that Rebecca produces, but also the engineering kind of thoughts or the inventor kind of thoughts that you might have so that you can both conserve uh, water, conserve, you know, fertilizers, whatever it may be, and intensify the production uh, on your farm. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things you've done to really uh, get a higher yield? Uh, again, in this, a little bit, I'm going to give Rebecca, a little bit of praise here that, I mean, in her, in her role with Western Sugar, she has really pushed the growers. And I think the growers are, are uh, looking for new and better ways to grow things. And I think the partnership has worked very, very well. 
but over, I mean, over the years, if you're in agriculture, it's like any other business. If you don't change, you're going to be let out to pasture probably. Uh, I mean, it, you've got to keep up. And one of the things in keeping up is, is, you know, taking care of the environment. And again, this partnership with Western Sugar as, as a co-op has been an, an advantage to be able to do some things that we may not be able to do as quickly without them. I mean, we've gone to uh, conservation tillage on almost 100% of our acres in the last 10 years, which has saved a tremendous amount of fuel, saved a tremendous amount of CO2 uh, from putting into the atmosphere and increased our yield. We are always trying new and better ways to do things, uh, whether it's, it's, it's uh, the implements we use. Uh, we've put a tremendous amount of capital in, in this area into irrigation projects, which we have, you know, transferred some of the dollars from the equipment we purchased to, to that, which has is, is made us better farmers. We do a much better job of applying water. We save millions of, of gallons of water and you know, everything we do is, is an acre feet of water, which is uh, a lot of gallons. Uh, we, we have, we have say, we put less nutrients on to sustain our crops. We do a uh, tremendous amount of soil testing to make sure we're doing it right. And, and we've just started. I mean, there's so many things we can do. We, we map yields, we map varieties uh, and, and be able to tell you know, within 100 feet in a field where our issues are and how to, to make those, those areas better. And so, and, our, and again, we go back to that limited number of acres that we can farm, we have to make every acre as, as viable as possible. And through the technology that we have today, it's easier to do it. And I mean, it's just fascinating. And again, if it wasn't for the technology part of this stuff, I don't think my son would be as interested as, as you know, the way things were a number of years ago. I mean, I, I remember growing up and my dad on the one row beet harvester and you had people driving on the back, picking dirt claws out of the beets and, and loading, you know, maybe a hundred ton in a day. And, and, you know, in today's world, we, we, we can load a hundred ton every hour. If, if that's, wow. uh, so the efficiencies have just, are, I mean, we're still getting the same dollars per ton of sugar beets as we did in 1985. So a lot has changed. Tractors went from, you know, $5,000 for a tractor to $500,000. So there's been an increase in that, but the efficiencies that we've looked at over the years has made it possible to stay in business and produce uh, food that doesn't come from China, that's grown right here in the state of Colorado, that's high quality, safe, and as much as we can possibly eat. Well, Les, uh, let me ask you a couple more questions and go back to Dr. Larson. Um, in terms of the, uh, the malt or the, the grains that you supply to these distillers, um, what, uh, how did, did the distillers come to you? Did you go to the distillers? How did you all sort of uh, team up uh, to make these hand sanitizers when, you know, sugar was in short supply, hand sanitizers were in short supply, uh, Clorox wipes are still in short supply, uh, but how did you team up in that? And, and uh, uh, did, was this your idea or somebody come to you and say, hey, we could use some help? Well, it was, it was the distilleries that, again, about, we do a lot of barley for Miller Coors Company. And we got hooked up with a couple of distilleries uh, being associated with them. They were buying grain from them. We were delivering grain to the distilleries and they go, oh, you farm. You know, yeah, I go, do you want to, you know, we need a local supplier for some rye and corn and wheat to make our, our bourbons and vodkas. And so we, we got hooked up with the distilleries and, and we're, we would actually make blends for whatever product they were trying to distill deliver it in totes. And once the pandemic started, they actually called us and said, you know, we just want some straight corn. We just want to make hand sanitizer, which is uh, ethanol or white lightning or whatever you want to call it. It's just pure alcohol 
which is what they needed to, to create the hand sanitizers. And they didn't ask that, you know, and we ended up just not sending a bill for the loads that we hauled down that was made into sanitize, hand sanitizer. So it was kind of a, a mutual thing and, and they were thankful and we were thankful that they were doing that too. So who were, it's, who, were, it's a, who were some of the distillers? I just assume not say okay. if that's okay. Right. I, I don't want to no, put no. them in the mix I, if they don't want to be. I'll send them a note uh, to thank them okay. later. Because, right. uh, and they're doing their part, uh, just as you're doing absolutely part in helping them. So, uh, Dr. Larson, in, in all your travels around the, uh, around the, uh, the space, uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to keep your uh, team clean so that you're not infecting anybody. Uh, have you run into any farmers who've had some difficulties, have had some illnesses uh, during this period of time, or has everybody been pretty healthy out on the farm? Everybody's been pretty healthy. I mean, you know, Paul mentioned there's points in time and there's a lot of interaction between the people working on the farm, but there is also opportunity to have a little bit of social distancing, especially for some of our farmers that have much smaller operations, or maybe it's just a lone guy and a, a tractor for the mid part of the season. Um, I have come in contact with one person, <clears throat> excuse me, that had COVID, um, but it was one of our own employees that was working in the, the ag department. So um, fortunately, no one on my team contracted it. We were all outside and we we're all fairly far apart when we did come in contact with them. But just to be safe, we did um, go into a 14 day voluntary uh, quarantine to make sure that we didn't pass it to anyone else in our organization. Because of course, we're extremely concerned that we've got this huge crop coming in, record breaking crop, which we're very excited about after the year we had last year in uh, Colorado but we need to keep our employees and our factories very safe in order to keep a steady supply of, of sugar coming out of the market and process those beets so they don't spoil in the pile. So we're very cognizant of providing personal protective equipment, social distancing, using hand sanitizer, providing time for washing hands. So that, that's a big concern for us this season. So um, during this harvest time, are you just making a big loop around all these states, kind of just checking out, uh, you know, the harvest as it's uh, progressing? Or what, what is your role now? I'm actually physically digging beets. So I'll dig, uh, we have 11 plots left to dig over four states, and we'll do that over the next 11 days. So uh, later this afternoon, I'll be digging our beets in Lovell, Wyoming. Then we'll dig a couple more plots here in Wyoming, move to Montana and come back and do uh, Nebraska and then Colorado last. So Paul mentioned his stats of a uh, hundred ton a day. That's about the, the rate of digging that I can do at 30 feet at a time digging small plots. So we're back in the olden days uh, with digging as far as our timing and volume. And then are you then testing uh, those things, those beats that you're, you're digging up or what are you doing with what you're digging? Absolutely. So <clears throat> what I'm digging are variety trials. And so that's what we use uh, to compare the new hybrids that the seed companies want to introduce on the farm to a set of standards to know if they have improved yield, improved sugar content, uh, reduced impurities that make the sugar hard to extract. And then we have a whole series of disease nurseries as well where we intentionally go out and get the crop sick. And then we select for those varieties that have the best tolerance in them to again reduce that risk on farm. So once we wrap this up by the end of September, I'll spend six weeks probably analyzing data and putting a data package together for our farmers so that they get one little nice summary sheet that tells them what's going to perform best in their area and what has the type of disease tolerance that they may need on their farm. Well, oh wow, that's now that's science. That is truly science, and and thank you for doing that. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the food industry, the agriculture industry, is essential, uh, and has been essential. Uh, you all are on the front line of this stuff, even if you may be in the back forty or somewhere near Level, Wyoming, or wherever. Uh, you are on the front lines, and. Uh, the fact that uh, sugar was in high demand and remains in high demand uh, because people are doing much more at home uh, 
Um, you know, baking being kind of a comfort thing, but also uh, it's a soothing kind of a thing. It's not just the food part, it's act, the actual activity uh, may have a calming influence in a very difficult time uh, in America. I mean, there's, there's a lot of psychological stuff going on uh, as you bake goods and, and you do that, do those things. And so uh, you all, whether it's helping out distillers who are providing hand sanitizers or applying science to improve farming, but also that science may spread, you know, may be applicable obviously to, to pandemics. My coming from, you know, a, a, a product or a, a good as opposed, you know, to from some kind of bat in a cave in China. Um, I just want to thank you both for being on the front lines and let you have the, the final say. I'll start with you, Dr. Larson, as to what you might want to say to the viewers here in the 7th Congressional District, so Jefferson County and Adams County, about uh, what you do about farming and about uh, getting through this darn pandemic. Yeah, I think maybe what I'll do in closing comments is just look at a little bit of bright side of the situation is that it's been a really tough circumstance and continues to be a tough circumstance for Coloradans, Americans, and citizens of this planet. But I hope, I, as a scientist, I've seen a lot of erosion in the trust of science and technology. There are a lot of doubters about scientific fact. So I do hope that having had this experience that it's going to build up this new trust and appreciation in science that's going to enable us, like Paul mentioned several times, we need technology in order to feed this planet and keep this planet safe and healthy. So I hope that we come out of this on the other side better as a society and believing in the, the facts and uh, data in science. No, thank you very much. I was... Uh... One of my undergrad um, majors was uh, economics, and there was an old guy named Thomas Malthus who said that uh, we were all going to starve to death back in the 1800s because the population was growing faster than production. Well, he forgot about innovation, ingenuity, improvisation, and, uh, and invention, and science, uh, which allowed for uh, farmers, uh, the agriculture industry to produce enough to feed, you know, a lot of people. I mean, there's still folks because we're, we've got distribution issues uh, across the planet and, and some income issues across the planet that are hungry and we need to, we need to resolve that. But the farming industry with science has uh, continued to meet most of the demand. And so one of those guys who is a producer, who is a farmer who has uh, been willing to change with the times and intensify, uh, you know, Paul, it's been great talking to you. I'm going to let you have the last word on this uh, Local Heroes uh, segment today. So uh, whatever you want to say, it's your, it's, you've got the floor. Okay. I don't know if I'm, a, I don't feel like a local hero. Uh, again, I've been doing this for a number of years. We're very proud of what we've done and where we come from, where we're going. Uh, our family made a commitment about 10 years ago to leave the family farm as a family farm and to continue into the future, even though we're right along the front range and there's other opportunities. But uh, the commitment was that we will have grandchildren and great-grandchildren that can still come here and, and, and visit the farm and hopefully some of those want to keep continue to, to, to work the ground, but whether we're growing sugar for, for the, 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 the mom and dad that want to make stuff at home or, or growing corn to, to make milk at a dairy, local dairy around the country, whether it's distillery products or, or barley for beer. I mean, we, we, we take a lot of pride in, in, in growing those crops and, and hope to continue. And, and again, I, I thank you for the opportunity. Probably a little more comfortable sitting in a tractor than sitting in front of a, a Zoom conference call, but that's okay. It, it all needs to be done. But again, thank you for the, the opportunity. Paul, Rebecca, thank you too for being part of our series today. Thank you 
whether you think you're local heroes or not, I think you're local heroes. And I think uh, the constituents that I represent here in Jeffco and Adams would uh, consider you to be local heroes as well. Thank you both uh, very much. Stay healthy, uh, stay safe as you drive around Wyoming and dig up uh, beets and uh, good luck in your harvest uh, next week, Paul.